What's up everyone? Welcome back to my channel. I've been on a small hiatus, but I'm back with this amazing video. And today we're gonna talk about multi-vendor checkout like Amazon, where you have multiple sellers and the customer is using one order to check out with those multiple sellers. And the best part about it is we will be using Bubble's native Stripe plugin. All right, let's jump in. So over here we can see a diagram of exactly what we are going to be doing. And that is essentially, instead of using Stripe to actually take out our app fee, we're gonna calculate it on our own in our Bubble app. Um, so over here we can see this is kind of like a Uber Eats type of scenario where the user pays $100 um, for their meal. And this is a little different because it's not multiple vendors, it's um, multiple, well, it is multiple vendors. It's the restaurant and the driver. <laughs> um, and here you can see the customer got $100. And then there's a Stripe fee, right? So this is just a regular charge at the moment. What happens afterwards is how we actually uh, decide um, the app fee, right? So over here, what we're doing is we're taking that transfer and we're only transferring from that original charge to the driver $20 um, and then transferring to the restaurant $70. And since the take rate is clearly 10%, right, we can see that we're left over after the Stripe fees was $6.8 for the platform. So this is actually really easy to do on Bubble. Let's have a look at how it's done. I actually built kind of a mini app. It's really ugly, but it really gets the job done. So over here, um, I'm just gonna go over the back end real quick because this is a little bit more of a complex video. It's not just a simple integration um, because you have to structure your database. And I will preface by saying, this is not the best structured database. This is just like the quickest one I could come up with for this demo. So I have an order and then I have a sub order, right? Because each order consists of sub orders. Um, and then I have order items and the order item stores the actual product that is being bought. Um, you can also store, for example, the amount of the product that's being bought in the order item. So think about like, you know, 10, you know, two pairs of shoes. Um, you can put that here. I didn't put it in here for now, but um, you can do that. That's why I have an order item and not just a list of products over here. Then we have our products, uh, a user, and a vendor. Um, and you can store however you like. It's really up to you. Everybody will do it differently. Over here, I kind of store the order, the sub order, the product, the vendor, and the vendor name. Um, you'll see why I do that later, but it's just to make it easy for me. And then in the sub order, I store the app fee, right? Because we're doing that transfer on that sub order and there's an app fee that's being taken out um, of that driver's payout, right? Um, he doesn't see it, but it is being taken out. And, okay, so we have the app fee, the order, the status, um, as purchased, not purchased, or refunded, the total cost, I should probably put this as not total, but the cost before fees. Um, and then the, or after, and then the transfer ID, and we'll get into that later, the vendor, and yeah, that's it. And then in the order, I store the charge ID, number of items, status, the same thing, sub orders, so what sub orders? I don't think I actually saved them, but it's their total cost and the list of vendors. Now, the reason I store the vendors everywhere is because for privacy rules, that's been helpful for me when I was on a real project. Um, just to keep in mind, it was just my style. There are a hundred ways to do this. You can uh, put these all together and create an option set to separate them. Whatever works for your app, every app is different. Um, this is just the quickest way I thought of. And then the product, the name, price, and the vendor, um, the user, so the user will always have an order and in user type, you know, whether they're a customer or a vendor and a vendor, and that'll have a name and a user associated. So a very simple app. 
Um, I didn't really go into privacy rules here, but let's just go in and see how it is as a customer and what's happening. So as a customer, I have this like very nice looking build a cart um, type of shopping experience. And you can see that the item is appearing there and I'll just add all of these to my cart. And we can see that I have six items over here and then I can go check out. And so over here, it's very, very uh, UI and UX. It's really beautiful um, <laughs> look. Um, so here we can see the checkout. And we can see that here we have <clears throat> sold by grocery two, sold by grocery two, and sold by grocery one and grocery one. So we're checking out with multiple vendors. We can see the peach, grapes, and soda are by one vendor and the apple pear and chili sauce is by another vendor and we can see the total here is $29 um, so let's go to the back end and see what an actual checkout will look like here um, because this is where it really comes into play how you manage uh, these type of checkout flows this is why I built this whole app so if we go to the checkout page and I click pay now, right? So we have that order over here. Um, afterwards, if anyone's interested, I will go over also just like how to build the cart. Um, but for now, I'm just doing the checkout page. And because I'm on a free app, I'm not using backend workflows, but I will tell you exactly where to use them. So I can't really run anything on a list here. Um, so the first thing is, is clicking pay now, and I'm just gonna charge the current user, okay? Um, and I'm just gonna charge the current user's email, um, group sum of prices, number. So that is really just like the checkout, the sum of the total cost of the purchase. And then USD, etc. this is a regular transaction. Keep in mind, I am not checking this. This is a regular uh, checkout transaction, charge the current user. I'm not transferring anything to the payee or anything of that sort. So. Very simple transaction. Next thing I'm do is I'm sending the state uh, of the checkout page as a charge and I'm sending it as the charge ID uh, just so it's easily accessible in the rest of these workflows. As you can see, it's uh, pretty long. So I'm setting a state of the charge. Again, not so important. This is where it gets interesting. So using the Stripe plugin, you can click on transfer to seller. So that's actually going to be, you don't need to create any API calls. It's just literally here. You can, if you have this native Stripe plugin, you just click transfer to seller. It's right there. Um, so transfer to seller. And what am I gonna transfer to them? I'm gonna transfer them um, the repeating group order items, list of orders filtered. So I'm filtering them by a specific vendor, right? So what I'm doing here is I'm transferring to one seller and then I'm transferring to another seller. If we go back to our diagram here, you can see it's a transfer to the driver and then a transfer to the restaurant. There's two different transfers here. If I had backend workflows, I would be running this on a list. I would be doing run API workflow on a list or I would do a recursive workflow and the type of thing I would be running it on would be a vendor and for each vendor I would do this. But because I'm just on a free app, I'm not doing that. But in your app, if you're doing a real app and the app I did you know, for a customer, that's what I would do. So do not do it exactly. This is more to teach you how the payments and money flows. So the first thing I'm doing is I'm transferring to a seller and over here, just for ease, I kind of kept in this little pop-up two lists. One was just like all the vendors. So I took all the order items and each item's vendor unique elements. That's all the vendors um, that I have over here. So if I had 10 vendors, this repeating group would have all those 10 vendors and the sub orders. So list of order items, each item sub order, unique ID. This is complicated, don't worry about it. It doesn't really matter. The point is, is that I am transferring to the first seller. I'm taking that all the, the list of items and the total amount for the first seller. So let's call it seller number one. 
and I'm multiplying it by 0 0.9. Now, why am I multiplying by 0 0.9? I'm assuming my app has a 10% take rate. So that's a 10% fee that the app is taking. Um, so I'm only sending the seller actually a 0.9 of what the customer actually bought from him. So if the customer bought $100, I'm sending the cost, uh, I'm sending him $90. So that $10 is the platform take rate. Um, and that will transfer, and I'm transferring it by checkouts charge. And remember, I set the state of checkout and the custom state of charge to the charge ID that I got from this sale. So I made this sale. I set the state of the page to the ID from this sale. That's from the customer. And then I'm transferring it to the first seller in this transaction. And I'm transferring only the amount that they're owed times 0.9, so minus 10%. And then I'm making changes to the sub order and I'm kind of getting in there the app fee. So that's just the reverse of what I'm paying them. You know, it's kind of what I'm paying them, what they're owed minus what I actually paid them. And that's the app fee that was paid. And then I'm changing the status to purchase. This is on the sub order. So remember, this is for a specific vendor's order. And then um, I am saving the from result of step three from the transfer. I'm saving the total amount. And very importantly, I'm saving the transfer ID. So this is result of this step, transfer ID. Okay, and we'll get back to that, why that's important. Um, so we transferred them, you know, what they're owed. And then I put a pause here. Again, do not look at this workflow. It's just because I'm on a free bubble account. And then I'm transferring to the second seller. Um, so I'm going from the first seller and I'm transferring, you know, in our example, it would be I'm transferring to, you know, grocery store one. I transferred to them what they were owed and that was $10. And now I'm gonna transfer to grocery store two, which is $19. Um, but I didn't transfer ten dollars. I actually transferred nine, and the app fee was one dollar. And here I'm going to transfer nineteen times zero point nine. And same thing, literally the exact same flow. Again, I would do this on a list um, in the backend workflow. And again, I'm saving the app fee and I'm saving the transfer ID in that sub order. And then I'm adding a pause, making changes to the total order. Um, and saving that charge ID and the total cost and the number of items. However you wanna do that, that's not important. The main thing is you understand that it's like a regular order and then you're doing transfers to the different sub orders. Um, and then that's pretty much it. That's how essentially I was capturing that app fee, um, but still able to transfer the money to the multiple sellers. So let's let's see how that actually looks in Stripe itself, um, just to kind of visualize what happened here. So we have kind of this seller two and grocery one. Um, and those are just two accounts I have there. And let's just pay and see this is gonna, the payment takes a minute, but sorry, it's a long workflow. See, it's going here. I also put some breaks there so it doesn't time out. And there you go. Perfect. All right, cool, cool, cool. So let's now I'm in my Stripe account and I just want to show you how it looks um, from my perspective. So we can see here we have these two transfers, right? We have a transfer of $16.65 and a transfer of $9. And that is what they were owed. Well, we know for the $9, it was like $10 minus one dollar because it's 10 percent take rate and the other one was 19 dollars times uh, 0.1 times 10 minus 10 percent and so we transferred these to these users and if you actually want to see if you go to connect on your stripe account um, i have these two users and i can see that the payments they received was here nine dollars um, and this is kind of the latest over here and if we go back, we can see that our other Stripe account, I did the same order many times. So you see a lot of them, but it's 1665. 
So we can actually see what's happening in our Stripe account in terms of the actual change of money over here. And so this is all nice and well, but this is where it actually got a little, where it got stumped is like, how do I do refunds now, right? Because that's, that's a bit more complicated because you're not just doing uh, the refund the current user. And so here you do have to use some API calls, but they are very simple. Um, so you can see here, we have a pretty simple Stripe API calls uh, set up and yeah, just private key and header. And I just put my secret key, it's cut off. So don't try and steal it. <laughs> it's also a test key. Um, and over here, we can see the first call. So what we actually need to do um, for this is we're going to, if we need to, for example, refund a partial order, right? Because we have two sub orders and one main order, we have to actually reverse transfer one sub order and then refund the actual amount we owe the person. So let's, let me pull up a diagram quickly of how that looks. I could not find one. But if we look back at our other diagram, we need to bring that payment back from the driver to our account, right? This is a platform account. And then only then do we refund the customer. Um, so over here, this is the reverse transfer. Uh, it's very simple. It's just a post request um, with Stripe transfers. And then the transfer ID, I put it in the header and in a minute, I'm going to show you the workflows of how we get that and slash reversals. So we're reversing a transfer. We're not creating a transfer. Um, and down here, you do want a parameter um, over here, which is amount. Uh, make sure it's spelled exactly. And make sure you tick these two boxes, the query string and the optional. Because if it's not optional, you have to put in an amount. And if we want to re refund the whole thing, we don't. We we don't want to have to like specify the amount. We just can just call this, make this call without specifying and it'll refund the entire amount. It'll reverse transfer, sorry. It'll take it from our connected account to our account. And then the last call is the basic call. I'm sure some of you at least um, know this. It's just the refund and it's very basic. We're just following, we're using a charge ID and we just, simple post request to refund and that will take it from our account our platform account to the customer um, and here we specify the charge and the amount um, very similar call to this last one so that's all we need now let's see um, how that looks for us over here so I have this home page where I have kind of our orders and here is the order we had. It's very nice. Um, this is $28.5 was the total amount. And I'm actually gonna do a full refund and I'm gonna walk you through the workflows before I do that. So let's look at the full refund. So I'm gonna use Stripe reverse transfer and I'm just gonna search for sub orders and it's gonna be current sales order, right? So we want that sub orders and first items, transfer ID. So again, I would do this on a list in a backend workflow, but because I don't have that, I'm only working with two vendors. I'm just doing it in the same workflow, but hopefully you get the idea. So I'm reverse transferring from the first, from the first sub order um, and I'm using the transfer ID I saved in the workflow and that will reverse transfer the $9, right? And then I'm creating a second workflow where I'm getting the second items uh, transfer ID. So essentially you're running it on a list of all the vendors, all the sub orders that were part of this order and you need to reverse transfer the total amount and using that transfer ID we saved. And then what you do is very simply you refund the current orders charge ID. So let's let's just see how that flow of funds actually works. So if I click full refund, it's gonna take a second and we can see it moved from my orders because it was refunded. And let's look on our Stripe account <coughs> and see how this looks. Okay, perfect. So we can see that we have these transfers down here. 
And then we have these transfer reversals. So first is reversing from the connected account um, to our account. And only then, so this, see this is a plus, it's not in brackets, it's a adding money to our account. And only then do we actually refund the full 2850. And just to illustrate, I'm gonna show you how to do partial refunds because this is where it gets really complicated. Um, where you have to do a partial refund of a small, you know, one order or even one product. Um, and you can see here that the, because it's doing a full refund, it's returning also that app fee that we took, right? Because 16.65 uh, plus nine does not equal 28.5. That was the amount that we actually took as a platform. So let's look at how we do a partial um, refund of, for example, one of the orders. Okay, so now I created a new order um, and it's very similar, literally the exact amounts, uh, same amount, same products. And in this case, I'm just gonna do a partial refund and I just wanna walk you quickly through the workflows. So with a partial refund, what I'm doing is, okay, so first I'm getting the first sub order. Um, so in your app, you would define the sub order you want to do a partial refund for. Here I'm really simplifying it to the max and just saying partial refund is just for the first sub order, so for the first vendor. Um, so I'm doing a search for the sub orders and I'm getting that first item. And I'm not actually changing anything here, I'm just storing it so then I can refer to it throughout these workflows. And then I'm doing the Stripe reverse transfer. Um, and I'm getting that transfer ID, result of step one, which is that first sub order. And I'm doing that reverse transfer, and I'm leaving this empty because I want to do a full transfer. Um, and this is where it gets a bit more complicated. Um, on the Stripe refund, over here, I'm doing it to current sales charge ID, right? So I'm bringing it into my account and then sending it to the customer. But here's where it gets a little bit more complicated. It's not too bad, honestly. But I'm taking the cost after fees, right, that I defined. But that's not the total amount the customer paid, right? If they paid $10 for a bottle of wine, you can't just refund them $9, right? Because that's everything you reversed, right? They're expecting $10. And so that's why you have to tack back on that app fee, right? We save that app fee, that $1. So you're re re only refunding $10, right? Out of that $28.5 order, you're only refunding that one vendor. And so that's $10. So it's gonna be that $9 you transferred plus the app fee you took. And here's the kicker where it's just because Stripe works in cents and we're not using, you know, the plugin, which already handles that for us, we have to multiply everything by 100. Everything we do through the API connector, we have to multiply if it's a specific number, multiply by 100, and that will be the total $10. So let's see how that looks. So if I click partial refund, perfect. All right, so let's see how that looks for us in our Stripe app. And perfect, you can see here that we have that transfer of nine dollars right from that uh, grocery store number one and then we're tacking on that one dollar fee that we took and we're sending it back to the customer from our account so that is how to do multi-vendor checkout on bubble um, using the stripe native plugin um, if you're not familiar with stripe connect this is for people who already know how to use it. Basically, there are plenty of videos on YouTube on how to set that up with the API keys, etc. So you can see I only have here the Stripe regular plugin, nothing special. Oh, I will hide those in the video, my keys. And, um, and then I have this extra two simple API calls, and that is it. So I don't have anything else special. I don't even run JavaScript. I don't even have the JavaScript plugin. Um, so if you like this video, oh, exposing them again. If you like this video, smash the thumbs up, follow me, let me know on Twitter. Um, 
that you like it and comment please i always look at your comments i don't have, always have time to answer and i will be soon creating a board where you can suggest a tutorial and i can add it and so if you like this video and want to tune out now's your time thank you for watching oh i will offer a link to my editor um in the description it will be paid because it took me a shit ton of time to actually <laughs> make this app this dummy app i thought it would be an hour but ended up taking a few days um so yeah a paid link to the editor if you didn't understand anything or really just want to dive deeper into how i actually structured it this is not perfect it's really okay and i did it really quickly um so now i will go over some quick updates on my channel um, I've been getting a ton, a ton of DMs, well, not a ton, but a few DMs about just, you know, follow-up questions to previous videos I've done and suggestions for new videos. And the truth is I'm learning here in public. So I don't actually know exactly what I'm talking about. I figure something out and then I create a video. Um, and so it's hard for me. Usually I'm not going as much in depth as some of you would like to go. But my goal here is to really help those who know Bubble, but are trying to get to that next step and learn with me. And so my goal is that eventually I can have some folks in my audience creating videos too, when they figure out stuff on top of my videos so that um, because I get bored with certain topics and I don't want to create, you know, three or four videos on SendGrid. Um, so I will soon be creating a leaderboard um, or a board, not leaderboard, just like a product hunt type of very simple interface where you can suggest videos that I should record and upvote them. I won't even have a login on it to start with. Um, hopefully I don't get spammed. And that way anyone who's looking at it can see exactly um, what tutorials people want and from there they can also create videos and i will allow people to submit them to me and i will cross post them because my goal is to really get as many people learning as much as possible on bubble and helping out the community um, as best as i can so that is my goal um, with that website it will be released in the next week or so and hopefully i'll be doing uh, weekly videos starting now i will be also branching out into some new um, no code tools I'm learning, which are um, Xano, which is a really cool back end tool uh, that I've been digging into, and Browserflow, which is an RPA tool, robotic process automation tool for your browser that I use a lot. So stay tuned and let me know that you like this video. This is my longest video. I'm sorry for those who had to wait this entire time, and hopefully, we'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.